Hi, and welcome. My name is T, and this is Shivani. Hi. We both work in responsible AI and human-centered technology. As generative language models become more and more available to developers, such as Google's own Palm API, we're really excited to help you build your own applications on top of this technology. There's a lot of ongoing research in the area of responsible development on what safety and responsibility even mean. What we'll talk about today is a small picture of some responsible approaches in a much bigger, much more complicated space of what all that can be done to build responsibly toward a safe product for everyone. First, let's consider why do we even need to ask this question? Why should developers, why should you, think about safety and responsibility when developing using large language models for generative AI? And how might that differ from other software development? There's been a lot of buzz about generative AI, both about what amazing technology it is, how well it performs for various language tasks, like summarization and creative ideation. Millions of people across the world are using these models. And in doing so, a lot of us are realizing that these technologies are powerful tools to enable us, but may also sometimes be toxic, hateful, or biased in what they synthesize. You might have already heard about how LLM chat systems have offered questionable advice, argued with, and even threatened violence against users. So it definitely has its flaws. Let's understand where some of these flaws might be coming from. Most LLMs are trained on very large, huge amounts of data, and that includes both the good and the bad. That data includes varied viewpoints with the range and diversity with which all people understand the world. Large models are initially trained to mimic the content they were trained on. In other words, the methods used to build these models reward it to be like the data it's trained on, often without understanding the context on what use cases the model could be applied to, of which there are many, as we've seen. Use cases that model developers hadn't anticipated when the models were being trained. The model itself cannot discern between what we as humans think of as good or bad, and so it can mimic both the good and the bad data equally well, which means unsafe information that is harmful to some users, including biases and stereotypes from the large amounts of information it's learned from, sometimes does show up in the model outputs. That's why we need to talk about and develop ways to practice safe and responsible development with LLMs to power the evolving landscape and multitude of use cases. With the goal of making the technologies that we build safe and fair, our mission here on Google's Responsible AI team is to conduct research and develop methodologies, technologies, and best practices to ensure AI systems behave in a responsible way. That's also why we developed AI principles to guide our product development. We want to use AI to solve important problems and continue to be thoughtful and intentional when developing new technologies. We would like to share these AI principles with you. You can learn more at the link below. There are seven principles, and we'll be leaning into several of the principles here as we talk about safe and responsible development, including avoiding unfair bias and being built and tested for safety. One that is relevant, but we won't go into detail today, is being accountable to people. This involves providing appropriate opportunities for feedback and relevant explanation. In our context, it means letting your users give you feedback and providing explanations when something goes wrong. Something will probably go wrong. Yep, for sure. <laughs> Before we start building, let's take a step back. Like any good product development process, start early. Follow established UX methodology to understand the product use cases and understand your users. Carefully think through the risks for your use cases. For example, what harms are likely for use cases and user journeys? If your use case is to summarize medical journals, the risks and potential impact of harms are much different and probably higher than if your use case is to help creative writers refine their own text. Also, consider how the UX affordances affect these risks. For example, in the UI on screen, which has two input options, risks are considerably different whether users can input any text versus selecting from a list of prompts. You'll need to have clear definitions on what you're avoiding, as well as being intentional about what constitutes high quality content for your product use cases. 
You'll need it in order to evaluate outputs from the model during testing later. For example, the type of content you're aiming for in a creative writing context to help users brainstorm will look different from the tone used for medical journals. How can a developer build safe and fair LLM applications giving this mission and product philosophy? I'll pass it on to Shivani to present a few techniques that we at Google have been working on. Thanks, T. That's the million dollar question. And I am Shivani. I lead the Scalable Solutions team in Google Research. We work on making Google's AI products more responsible for everyone. So let's try to answer that question. Picking up from where he left off, assume you have now discovered the risks that come with building this application that you dreamed of. Risks can mean unhelpful, toxic system responses to innocent user queries. These could also be inappropriate responses to certain subsections of sensitive users and many more. So how can you, the developer, reduce these risks and make your application more responsible and more worthwhile for your end users? It starts with using a responsibly developed foundation model for your application. This will give your product a strong foundation and a head start to build on. Responsibly developed models involve three core steps. Step one is the model's reliance on holistic data, data which has diverse considerations of several viewpoints and represent a gamut of different voices. Step two is for the model to have built-in safeguards. These help-based models avoid harmful text or images in their outputs from the very get-go. Step three is for this foundation model to be exhaustively evaluated and tested to validate these outcomes. So it's important to ensure that the model service you choose to access these models from has done this development responsibly. These services, as we do for Google's Palm API, may also provide you with additional safeguards and tools to enable responsible application development. This feels great already. And the question that follows is, if the foundation model owners have done all of this work, is that enough? We wish, but no. To ensure that the foundation model will work as well for the application you build, we recommend that you, the developers, take additional steps to measure and mitigate specific harms for your product needs. Basically, as we would say, bubble wrap this model before sending it to your product. Let's walk through what these steps look like together. The first step is to ensure that you build holistic data sets. Data sets that capture both the risks that you discovered your application might have as well as the good behaviors you wish to see in your product. This means ensuring that your data represents all types of users that your product will encounter. It means coverage of the diversity of users, but also ensuring the data has coverage on the adversarialness of your users. People who might want to break your system, for example. Armed with this good, holistic data the next step is to ensure that you measure your end-to-end -end system using this data. This will help catch harmful behaviors and equip you with the knowledge of any failure patterns that might emerge for your end users. These harms include, but are not limited to, measuring aspects like what percentage of your application responses were toxic, hateful, or dangerous for the end user. Since these thresholds could be different based on the application you're building, this measurement will help you quantify the risk that you defined early on. For creative writing applications, for example, it might be okay to talk about toxic scenarios. For a children's book, it may not be. It is to that end important to evaluate these risks in the larger context of your product. Finally, now that you've defined and measured potential risks of your product, the next step is mitigating these problematic behaviors. Mitigation can be achieved in several ways. Broadly, these approaches can be categorized into two, model tuning using holistic data sets and model safeguarding to prevent problematic inputs and outputs from your system. Out of these many approaches, 
the one that I would like to focus on today is mitigation by safeguarding your application. That is detection of potential harms in system inputs and outputs. My team and I have been working on approaches to detect adversarial inputs and policy violating outputs from large models using agile discriminators. These integrated with Google's Palm API offerings give you the developers an easy way to test and adjust across several safety dimensions of potentially harmful model inputs and outputs. So to recap, all that we talked about fits into the vision of a larger system in a flow like this. You let the right user requests pass through your system with advanced safeguards. These safeguards could be technologies like blocking adversarial inputs with classifiers or using smart query rewriting techniques to reduce adversarialness of these inputs. You could then also ensure that your model that is getting these user requests is fine-tuned for your specific product needs. And finally, you deploy additional filters to the end goal of either blocking subpar responses or falling back to semi-canned responses to prevent policy violating model behaviors for your end users. So you ensured a good foundation model and you ensured a lot of bubble wrap for this model by building your responsible application with all of the steps we talked about. Is that enough? Is it enough? While it might be tempting to feel that once is enough in this process, we recommend several iterations until your product goals are met. The mantra being, test, test, and then test some more. Each iteration ensures that you learn a little something new about your system. It also gives you an opportunity to reflect on unknown gaps that you may not have considered the first time around. Finally, iterations also help ensure that over time, you expand those holistic data sets and those safeguards that we talked about with diverse user interactions and many other adversarial ones. I know we've covered a lot, and Google cares deeply about building AI responsibly. But we also recognize that generative AI, the space is new, and this problem is hard. The landscape of large models is constantly evolving. To that end, having approaches that generalize beyond one model are difficult but needed. Approaches that help developers directly engage with these tools are also needed to keep up with this changing landscape. Google's new externally available tools, such as Maker Suite and the Palm API, help developers quickly prototype and get started. You can iterate on prompts for your model, augment your dataset with synthetic expansion techniques, and easily tune your own custom models. There's also a large body of ongoing research that developers are encouraged to draw from. Absolutely. And we would love to share these resources as Google makes more of our research available for you. So please keep following along our Google AI blog. This is our time, and we want to make sure that we acknowledge the broad set of partners across Google in our responsible innovation team, our own responsible AI team, as well as the trust and safety team, without whom this talk and this work would not have been possible. Yes, thank you. As we all learn more about this space, we'll come back and share with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.